Uh, so how do you do you like Moscow? What do you think about DevCam? Uh, it's my first time in Moscow. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love so much of the architecture and the lighting. And there's just so much effort putting into like public spaces and communities and stuff. It feels really cool. Um, also my first time at DevCam. It's really impressive. I think they've done a great job assembling it. And it's really exciting seeing some of the talks and the games that they've put forward here. Okay, great. Uh, so your job title is a world builder, right? Yes. So can you tell us more about it? Uh, what is your duties, what is your contribution to the projects? Sure. Um, so I build levels. Um, under Battlefield I build multiplayer levels. Um, so a world builder really is someone who is strong in both the level art and the level design. And so they can kind of understand the process from beginning to end. Um, and not need to really balance it between a bunch of people. They can kind of be the person who is in charge of the level from beginning to end. So you are, uh, gives more like feedback like a manager or just doing something by yourself? Um, so as a world builder, uh, you are the one building the level. So you're hands-on every day, uh, taking the level all the way from concept of white box to final and polish, okay. which is really fun. Uh, uh, you uh, talk on your session about uh, believable instruction. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more uh, how to prototype uh, believable instruction uh, for sci-fi and fantasy game? Well, I haven't built a sci-fi game, um, but I, I've given it quite a bit of thought. And I think the, the things that are important with building a believable infrastructure is understanding why certain elements are there. So for instance, um, if you look at a, a street, that's always my first thing. The purpose of the street is for public transport and filing people in and out. So a sci-fi world needs to also have that because they have the same needs in terms of market, infrastructure, um, and uh, transportation, obviously. It might not be a paved road. It could just be like, you know, some dots through space or something, but some sort of transport needs to be indicated. And the same happens with like the road lines and the road markings and the cables, like power and resources and um, information all need to be in that transportation. So by adding elements that represent those in your sci-fi world would probably get it to feel a lot more believable rather than just having like spaceships hovering randomly space. Um, and I think the same thing applies to like interior spaces and exterior spaces. If you have like a docking station or something, then you, you should look obviously at what we've built today um, and films about neo future and far future um, where they've really implemented well. Like they know there needs to be like a locking mechanism, there needs to be some sort of uh, seal, there needs to be some sort of um, paneling on the side to protect in case of impact, that sort of stuff. Um, and then the same thing applies for like interior spaces, you know, when you're in an interior, it's not just a flat wall, right? There's some trims, there's some wear on certain places, um, it's got a really nice specular, so you need to really think about getting nice materials in those spaces um, and lighting it for purposes of use. So like, what is the space being used for? How would they light it to, to facilitate that use? So I think those are things that are usually things that I think about in a space that would also apply to other genres. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there was one of your uh, article and there was a, a phrase, adrenaline arc. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Um, so, have you played Battlefield? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know when you're playing a multiplayer match and um, and you and your squad are really fighting hard for this base or this point and, and you know it's been fairly even throughout the entire match but it's getting down to the last few tickets and you know you need this base in order to not lose more tickets mm -hmm. um, and to, to win the match and you're really fighting for it and it starts to build up this like excitement oh no I can't die but I have to I have to get them I need to find new cover I need to make sure that we're coordinating with our squad and that sort of builds up this adrenaline. Um, and we, we usually look at uh, how the tickets and how the gameplay moves throughout a match. So it usually does form this sort of arc where at the very, very end, it's building up to this, this tension where you really want to win. Um, and then of course, when you win the match or you lose the match, the arc dies down again and you can start over. Um, so, so when we talk about the adrenaline arc, it's usually building off of that player experience. Now, not every single um, 
time you play the game, you're going to have that experience. But that is generally the most common arc for so the it's just more uh, feeling than just mm -hmm. the environment. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so I mean, we'll we'll add things into the environment that'll. Uh, help emphasize that. So the weather, for instance, or um, adding in like you know elements that get destroyed, or um, you know everything that can kind of add to that experience and and heighten it even more. Okay. Uh, what do you think? What is the difference uh, between the pipeline for triple A projects and indie projects? Uh, is it possible to uh, scale production like from Battlefield 4, I don't know, about team 10 or uh, mm -hmm. 20 person to 5 or 4 uh, people? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple different elements that, that change when, it, when mm -hmm. you go from a big project to a small project. First off, when you have a big project, um, you know, with Battlefield, we have the previous Battlefield games to work mm -hmm. off of. We already have the game mechanics, we already have the engine. Um, and we have all the gameplay there. So what we're doing then is we're adding features uh, that enhance the experience and we're tweaking the base features to really polish it even more and then we're adding content and that's like the levels, that's the weapons, that's the characters, everything like that. Um, so in order to scale that down, um, if you already have that base of good player, like the good gameplay base and the engine and everything, then you don't need to spend a lot of time getting that up. For instance, if you start in Unreal, uh, it's already got a shooter element there, so you don't really need to build those mechanics in. Um, but in terms of building content, you would just build less content and you wouldn't polish it as much. Um, so I think it would scale fairly well from a content perspective. It's just a matter of gameplay, how that would change. And I think also when you're when you're scaling down to a smaller team size, you really need to make sure that the people on the team um, have a diverse skill base. Because when we have a really big team, we can have specialists, like one guy who's really good at making trees, and one guy who's really awesome at making characters. But if you only have like four or five people, then you know everyone needs to be good at planning, everyone needs to be good at lighting, everyone needs to be good at understanding like uh, composition and concept and stuff. So I think it's a little harder on a smaller team, but uh, it can be very rewarding and you can iterate faster. So there's definite pros to having a small team. Okay, and what is, uh, do you like uh, work in small teams more than in big teams? Or it's uh, I love working in small teams. Um, I love getting to know the people that I work with and hanging out with them because you're spending a lot of time together mm -hmm. and you both have uh, very similar passions. So the way that we work is we usually break up into pods. So each pod will be in charge of a level or an area or um, a, a set geographical location or something. Um, so we'll have like two, three people, maybe four people in a pod. Uh, and then we'll have like four or five pods on the levels team, for instance. Um, and that's usually how we break up so that you can get that small team feeling um, while still having the diversity and strength of the big team. Um, so I, I definitely prefer that, um, and it's it's really fun to be able to kind of trade off your skills. Like if you're on a small team, say I'm better at lighting and he's better at concept and, and composition, so then I'll do a little bit more of this and that. So I think that's really fun. Okay, uh, we know that you have one uh, small uh, side project, uh, maybe I don't know two. <laughs> Can you tell us more about your side projects? Um, my side projects personal. Yes. In games or just in life? <laughs> I think games. <laughs> so okay. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's see. I, I don't really have any like large environments that I'm working yeah. on right now. For me, it's mostly thinking about. Um, I'm doing a lot of game jams in Stockholm mm -hmm. right now and helping out with organizing those, uh, mostly for uh, young girls in our schools and stuff, and helping them get into. Um, not being afraid of programming and building things and creating the games that they want to play. Uh, so that's been really rewarding. And um, I'm thinking about starting up uh, building a roguelike soon, so that might be really fun. So yeah, we'll see. sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we've done. Thank you, Lina, so much. Thank you. Enjoy your stay here. It was really nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you.